You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon and Rassilon. Mm-hmm. Today we're going to be talking about the first serial of the 11th season of Doctor Who, The Time Warrior, which consists of four episodes that aired from December 15th, 1973 to January 5th, 1974. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Bisexual Brigadier for getting the DVD for us. Thank you, Bisexual Brigadier. Yes, thank you so much. It's always fun when those things like come in the mail and we're like, I didn't order anything. What is this? No. And then it's DVDs and I'm very excited. And then we watch Doctor Who and it's fun. Yeah. You can follow her on Tumblr at bisexualbrigadier.tumblr.com. I'd also like to give a shout out to Jason Perry. He is our newest Patreon patron. <gasps> Hooray! Thank you very much for supporting the podcast and we get to say your name. On, <laughs> on the internet radio. You're famous now. Yeah. So you'll have to deal with that. If you'd like us to shout out your name, just go to watchyourasslon.com slash support. And there are multiple options for us to do that. So just check it out. There's a bunch of stuff there. But let's get to the, the main event. We have returning special guest. <gasps> That's him. Oh, hi, guys. Is that me? <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have a name. Yes, I am. I am the anonymous, uh, anonymous nodcaster. Hi, guys. I'm Brian. I have a podcast. It's called Harry Sullivan is an imbecile. We're a fortnightly podcast. That means we drop an episode every two weeks. Uh, we're a discussion podcast, so we just talk about interesting uh, ideas, uh, such as you know what sort of doctor would Jodie Whittaker be, and what what do we have to look forward to with Chris Chibnall, and is it really morally correct to replace uh, dead actors with uh, other actors in a TV series? So lots of fun. And I uh, hope you listen to it. It's a good, good time. I have listened to five of the six episodes and an episode you didn't actually put up. Ooh. So. <laughs> secret episode. Double secret probation episode. Oh, and I just want to add, if you want me to shut out your name, you just have to buy me the right drinks. We are that kind of podcast, right? Yes. Oh. Yes, for sure. Can I fucking swear here? Fuck yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Just want to be sure. Because uh, we have an expletive tag on our, our podcast as well. So if you are of a tender age or you don't like the F word or mentions of uh, sex gas when we talk about Torchwood, then maybe we're not for you. But if sex gas is your thing, see a doctor. The maybe doctor? we need to be like more upfront about like, hey... There you know, be... we are not listed as explicit on iTunes. <gasps> you talked Which... about cum so much last time. Well, it was relevant. <laughs> mommy, mommy, what's cum? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's what Danny and I call baby batter. It was relevant to the podcast, uh, to the to the episode we were talking about. We're just, uh, just destroying children's minds. Enough with this gay banter. Let's talk about the Time Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited. There's a number of firsts. Yeah. This is the first episode of the last season of The Third Doctor. The John Portuera, yes. It is the first episode with Sarah Jane Smith. I almost said the first episode with Sarah Jane Adventures. Is it weird that I saw her and went, oh my gosh, she's so young. <laughs> I only know her as being... From the new new series and from, from her own show. Yeah, her own show. And just being like, oh, you're a bit like, like I was shocked by it. Like, I don't understand how time works. <laughs> it was a similar experience when we were watching Twin Peaks. Well, the first time we watched it was like when the new show had already, the new series had already started. So we marathoned through the first two series and we hit that third series. And it was like, oh my God, they're all old now. What happened? Yeah, it's almost as if 25 years had passed. Jesus fucking Christ, how did that happen? They did some really good old makeup. So, anyway, the owls are not what they seem. 
Uh, oh, sorry, wrong podcast. Ah, uh, yeah, definitely a first, and obviously the the titular character, as they say, the uh, Time Warrior, is the first time we ever see a Sontaran, created by Robert Holmes, who is uh, somebody who has uh, created quite a few uh, characters that have survived to the new series, Ottens. Sadly, not Milo Clancy. No, not Milo Clancy. Oh, my goodness. Well, God bless Milo. Uh, so yeah, Autons, the Master, and of course the Santarans being the big three. Also in this episode, he, uh, he names Gallifrey. First time we ever hear the Doctor say the word Gallifrey. It also happens a lot like the first time the phrase Time Lords was dropped. It just happens kind of casually. Uh, and it's not even like the Doctor says it, it's like one of the, um, random henchmen is talking to, uh, the guy that hypnotizes people, and he's like, uh, his people, the Time Lords. And it's, it just says it, drops it very casually. And that's the very first time we ever heard Time Lords. And the very first time we heard Gallifrey, it's dropped very casually. The Doctor's just like, yeah, I'm from Gallifrey, what of it? It's not like a big deal. What's up, bitches? I'm from Gallifrey, yo. You motherfuckers be coming around to Constellation Custurbius, I'm gonna fuck you up! <laughs> I also read that in the original script, it was Galfrey, not Gallifrey, just Galfrey. Was it changed or was it just mis- mispronounced when they were filming? <laughs> Is this a Metabilis or Metabulus 3 uh, instance? Yeah, I don't know. The doctors have been known to flood their lines, right? I just really like the idea that it was a mistake that, like, established a core fact of the show. <laughs> Twas ori- originally scripted as Galfrey, yes. Which uh, sounds like a uh, Nordic uh, warrior, female warrior, who takes you off to Folkvanger. She's Valkyrie, who takes you off to Folkvanger after you've uh, made a mess of yourself in, in, on the street. I don't know. I lost the analogy on that one. It all sounded right. Yeah. I know. Well, I mean, you know, I do know a little bit of Nordic Nordic knowledge. Nordic knowledge. I've seen Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> Another new thing. Right at the beginning of this very episode, new credits. <gasps> all of him is in space, not just his face. Not just his face, whole body in space. Welcome to the era of slit scan. All of him is in space, and also he has like a weird gem hole that he comes out of. He's in like a, a space tunnel that is <laughs> shaped like him. <laughs> it's like John Pertree's like, oh, this is this fits me very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and the the diamond logo, which uh, you will see from now until uh, the end of season eighteen. I think. Is it 18? I don't know. After the John Nathan Turner uh, era takes over, I get kind of ragey, so we'll not talk about that right now. Also, they stopped calling them Episode 1, Episode 2. It's now Part 1, and I think it stays that way except for one serial. Did they just up. forget? I guess. <laughs> it just becomes, it goes back to Episode 1, 2, 3 for a little bit for the destiny of the Daleks, and then it goes back to Part 1, Part 2. A lot of information on the Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> you are getting your money's worth, you Patreon subscribers. You're getting getting full throttle, full thrusting information here. This is an educational podcast where you will learn about Doctor Who and bodily functions. Whether you like it or not. So yeah, um, this being uh, Sarah Jane's first episode. Sarah Jane, who I believe she is a journalist. <laughs> I, I mean, they never they they don't mention it during the series, so no, not at all. I'm surprised you, have you picked really up on that. You really be paying attention to pick up on it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really subtle how they do it. Obviously, uh, Sarah Jane um, being kind of you know uh, maybe not really a continuation of of the girl power that Joe Grant had, but you know definitely uh, a very independent woman, a very um, strong character woman, as you'll see in. In upcoming episodes, both, you know, with John Pertwee and, 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 uh, and Tom Baker, uh, spoilers. Wait, it's not gonna stay John Pertwee forever? Uh, I'm so sorry, Joe. I thought there was only three doctors. <laughs> well, there's that whole Metabulous 3 thing that has to happen, and Metabulous 3 is how it's actually pronounced, and... I'm only saying Metabulous because uh, it was some sort of episode where Matt Smith called it Metabulous. Oh, that's bothersome. For for us people who, who get uh, in, enraged by that sort of thing, it was it was not good. It still seems like you're a little a little sore. Sonic screwdrivers were squeezed in frustration that night, I'm just let's just say. Yeah, anyway, so this uh we start off uh with uh Iron Grand Star. Yes, this uh this is the first episode which I have titled Stardust because it is reminiscent of said uh book slash film. 
by Neil Gaiman. When this episode started, I think I said out loud, I am not sold on this. <laughs> Because of the falling star? It's just like two medieval people. I mean, it's more like they're all talking and I'm just like, I don't care about any of these people. Yet. No, yeah. You have to get to know them better. Yes. But when it first opens, I don't know. I like was not in the mood for like medievalness. Which, by the way, another first. This is the first and only pseudo historical for the third doctor. Oh, but it's these these guys who I guess have kind of just taken over this castle in the absence of the people who actually live there. Like, they're all off fighting war, and they just, like, took it over. Well, yeah, it's Iron Gron and his and his uh, lusty band of criminals and his uh, sidekick, uh, Blood Axe. Who has the best name and also makes the best faces. Blood Axe is, is basically, I mean, I, I could definitely uh, see Cyril Shapps playing him for as, as weasley and, and, and weak as he is, he tends to be. So, but Iron, Gla- Iron Gron is a uh, frustrated uh, conqueror who is uh, out to uh, defeat King Edward, L- Lord Edward, or and uh, Queen Eleanor, Lord Edward of uh, Wessex, yes, to take over his uh, his kingdom. So he's looking to expand. So he's basically he's stolen his castle. He's stolen the castle, and uh, he wants uh, wants to set up uh, set up some uh, alliance in with uh, Lord Ed- Lord Edward of Wessex. Mostly just because he's out of wine. Lord. Uh, Edward of Wessex, played by Alan Rowe, who uh, many may know as Evans from uh, uh, the Moonbase. Lady Eleanor, who EastEnder fans will e- immediately uh, grok as a Dot Cotton from EastEnders, obviously, since I just said EastEnder fans. The guy who plays Iron Gron, to me, looks like a, a teen star from a Disney Channel original movie grew a very thick beard and is trying to act tough. Yeah, you really couldn't let go of that one when we were doing when we did the watching on the live feed. You that and we just kept asking you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember for the life like he reminds me of a very specific Disney Channel star and I don't know who it is and I can't Hannah Montana. Is it the kid yeah. who starred in Luck of the Irish? It is not the kid. That's the one you like. It is. I had a crush on him. It's the only one you ever remember. He was cute. He, he was... had those pointy ears in Luck of the Irish. And that was good. I know who that one is. I just can't remember the, the kid that I'm <laughs> What era of. are you remembering him from? I want to say it's 90s. 90s-ish. Airy. 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 Era. I don't know, but also I'm bored with this conversation. <laughs> and that's Fine, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> but a Starlands, right? Yeah. Well, it's Starlands, Star Crashes, yeah. And uh, so Iron Gron is like, that's my star, and we're going to claim claim it for my castle. But when they go to go to uh, claim the, uh, the the falling star, well, lo and behold, a little man pops out. It's a it's, tiny Epcot. It's not Claire Danes. It's I didn't say little women. I said a little man. Jesus. It's what? yeah. It's, I said she was in Stardust. <laughs> oh, uh, it's a centaur named Lynx with a X. We don't see assuming. yet properly. He's got his helmet on. Uh, he is dressed in resplendent in typical Santaran fashion, uh, which is you know a really puffy gray uh, jumpsuit and an iron helmet with a neck brace around it. The design for it and the voice of the Santaran. Haven't really changed. Well, he sounded remarkably similar. <laughs> yeah. The actor is Kevin Lindsay, who uh, he will pop up again one more time as a Santarin in uh, Tom Baker's first season. So that's something for you guys to look forward to. Uh, Santarin looks vastly different in that episode. Uh, so, sorry. The the design of it, I can see there's definitely going to be some changes. But it looks fairly similar to what we see in New Who for, uh, Dr- what's his name, Drax? No, Drax is... Strax? Yeah. Strax with an S. Drax is... Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> Strax, yes. And um, the voice is very similar. I think uh I think it gets less hairy. I don't understand why it's so hairy. Well, this is a first time. So I mean let's let's kinda be fair. You know, the first time the Cybermen came out. Socks. I was frightened by the sock face Cybermen, though. I found them to be terrifying. Lombasian Cybermen. Up until, you know, the, they had to carry that refrigerator on their chest all the you know, all over the place. The mini fridge. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, uh, Peter Capaldi, apparently, uh, find the Mondasian Cybermen to be, you know, 
the quintessential Cybermen. I like their, their right, voice, And the Capaldi too. episode with them made them even more frightening. Pain. 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 <laughs> so this is an episode that is uh, obviously... Uh, first se- first uh, episode of the season, it is the first episode after Joe has left. Yeah, I left. Joe is gone. He's no longer here. Joe Grant uh, also left. But yeah, so, you know, you kind of get the sense that, you know, the Doctor kind of has this, you know, a little bit of heartbreak from it because he is kind of rude and kind of dickish. He is such a dick all throughout the serial. Yeah, I mean, up until about the point he he warms to Sarah Jane finally, you know, he kind of is, you know, oh, you know, oh, you're just a girl. Oh, you know, oh, well, I'm going to pop into my TARDIS and we're going to say you know, whatever. He treats, <laughs> he treats her an awful lot like he treated Joe for like an entire season. You know, I mean, Terror of the Autons, let's, I mean, okay, also written by Robert Holmes, by the way. So maybe, maybe it's Robert Holmes. Maybe Robert Holmes has this complex, had this complex about, you know, the third doctor and his companions, kind of like John Peel had with the seventh doctor and ace in the Virgin New Adventure books. I had no problem with the doctor being written as a dick on account of he is. <laughs> right. And I know I have to be like, it's the time, whatever. But when he's being written as a sexist dick, I find it really tiring. <laughs> well, and, you know, he's kind of le- lost his best friend in, in Joe Grant. When, when, when you're wounded and nursing a broken heart, you do kind of, you know, lash out at those around you, whether they deserve it or not, yeah. But yeah, they're in this uh, bunker where... Uh... The brig has brought him. They're investigating the disappearance of several uh, scientists. And equipment. And uh, they get to meet Rubish. <gasps> Rubish. He's delightful. The delightful uh, Professor Rubish, who just introduces himself, walks up to the doctor and says, Rubish. Like he's a Pokemon. Gotta catch them all. And apparently that's, that's what Lynx is doing with, uh, yeah, so. This cereal is exactly like Pokemon. Oh my god, we've hit the meta so early in this episode he is your basic sort of like scientist stereotypical looking scientist with like the graying hair the the glasses and the lab coat and the nutty the nutty professor uh vibe and the doctor's not there to investigate so much as he's like one of the scientists who's like being under watch yeah because there's also this whole thing like where the brig says we're gonna put all of our eggs in one basket basically so we can keep an eye on them and the doctor's just basically like or, you know, they'll steal all the eggs, which is basically what happens. So the doctor ends up, what, he traces the signal back to medieval times and decides, hey, you know, let's go investigate. And Sarah, Jane, who I think is a journalist. When they start off, uh... She's introduced as a scientist. Yeah, he's like, aren't you a virologist? She's introduced as Lavinia Smith. Which is the name of her aunt. Rubish introduces himself to the doctor and the doctor says, he's like, who are you? And the doctor's like, I'm John Smith. And he's like, oh, that's weird. There's another Smith here. And it doesn't even look like Lavinia Smith at all. She's just there to see if she can get a scoop. Her aunt uh, is a viral. she's a journalist? Possibly. I think the term's reporter. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Like like I said, it's never, it's never defined, like, concretely defined. It just seems, I don't know. They don't say it, like, multiple times, so it's hard to know. Yeah, they don't spend, like, a whole time establishing it, and then re-establishing it, and then establishing it again. And then establishing it one more time, just just to make sure. Right. Yeah, they don't do that. Because this <laughs> show is about subtlety. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the doctor kind of calls her out on it, because he read his her aunt's paper, and her aunt's obviously, like, much older than she is. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you had to have been, like, 12 when that happened also uh he's like but maybe i'm glad you're here maybe you can make yourself useful and then she's like how and he's like you can make coffee gross and I was like ah wah, wah, wah. no <laughs> and during all this rubish is just in the background like riding on the tardis with chalk just absent-mindedly it's and it's like the doctor's going chalk what a great idea maybe i'll use that someday <laughs> in a few hundred years and, uh, and it'll completely disappear from the entire uh notion of my being you know fun fact when uh john pertwee was cast they originally wanted to have him play the guitar and sing ballads i mean because patrick Troughton played the recorder so they thought, you know, that every doctor should have a musical instrument. We'd all know that the first doctor is a wonderful lyre player. He is, and only the most acute ears can listen to it. <sighs> Did you hear that? Oh yes, it was beautiful. You could say he was a liar. 
No. No, okay. Got <laughs> That's fine. What, other people can't do it? Just you? Yeah, just me. I'm the only one who can do it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I was stepping on toes already. I apologize. Usually that's the joke I make and Tony says no. So yeah, I'm actually like offended this is because a bit he's of a, doing my bit. Yeah, this is a bit of a role reversal here. <laughs> you've, you've, you've thrown off the dynamic. <laughs> I am the cousin Oliver of this podcast. I am the, I am the scrappy-doo of this podcast. I've, I've thrown off the dynamic immensely, so <laughs> up is down, left is right. Directions are other directions. Water is dry, and yeah, so, and I don't have bus fare. Anyway, so yeah, uh, the doctor, uh, and, and Sarah Jane, who sneaks into his TARDIS, uh, they travel back in time to Iron Gron's, uh, era, 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 the Middle Ages, whilst investigating around sarah gets captured thinking you know she's at a renaissance festival well this is actually after uh because uh the doctor is trying to figure out what's going on and there's like uh a scene where lynx appears in a on the stairs in a ghostly form uh Uh, in a haunted house and unit soldiers being what they are they shoot and badly miss him even the fact that it's an apparition they still miss it (laughs) they can't shoot anything and it's at this point that the brig comes in and is is notified that the rubish has disappeared and all this and he says he says oh my giddy aunt he does and i got so excited but that's when the doctor realizes that past and present are mixed up and he's gonna go go back to the past marty where we're going, Sarah, we don't need coffee. Also, while all this is happening, <clears throat> Iron Gron has sort of taken Link's prisoner, but it's like, I will give you your freedom if you will make weapons for me. Can we at least uh, talk about my favorite part of that episode is when Lynx comes out and they first meet him, and he drops the tiniest little claiming flag in the world. It is adorable. Shades of Marvin the Martian. It's white. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, like, it pops up and then like two flags go, fling. They shoot out like little. It looks golf. like a tiny surrender. It does. It was a lot better in the research and design stage. I think is what they were what they were thinking. But he's help. He's kind of helping out Iron Gron. Like he does not care. Yeah, he's not afraid of him or anything. He's just like, fine. Here are some weapons. It'll be funny to watch. Iron Gron's the honey badger. He don't give a damn. He don't give a shit. They also get a prisoner. They they capture a prisoner uh, from King Edward's court. And, uh, have Lynx unlock his mind with, uh, this, like... Flashlight. Hypnotizing thing. Yeah, with a flashlight. Which apparently, I think, in there is a version of this on the DVD that has new updated CGI effects where, like, they put in lasers and stuff. No, I want my shitty original effects. Thank you very much. I'm not going to watch that. I'm gonna say, as far as, you know, special editions are, uh, uh, are concerned, the, the special edition for, uh... Day of the Daleks was actually much better than what we had before. It couldn't have been that much better. Ah, uh, well, you know, well, you know, that's that's a debate debate for off mic. So we'll uh, we'll have a nerd storm then. All right, but it's a terrible serial. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it made it better. I just said it would, you know, and improve the experience from intolerable to slightly less intolerable to slightly digestible. But he uh, basically uses that he unlocks his mind and finds out all the plans that the king has in regards to well i think it's actually there's like a lord and he's trying to get help from the king so (laughs) this is like the second time the third doctor and maybe the doctor just in general has tardis exactly where he wants to go (laughs) on purpose well you know he does have the time coordinate codes back again so you know because you know the everybody here has seen the three doctors i assume by this point so the the time lords have said hey you know what let's give the doctor back his knowledge of time travel and then but at the same time you don't know if possibly you know the time lords are kind of controlling his tardis anyway oh that's a good point maybe they always have been intriguing indeed spooky so but they wind up in medieval times sarah jane thinks she's uh at a rent fest and interrupts this robin hood motherfucker who's trying to shoot uh i don't know the bad guys iron gron i guess but then she because of her interruption she gets taken prisoner by iron gron and then the doctor's sneaking around trying to find out what's going on and that's when he we see the santara d helmets 
and we see his potato head. He decuffs. And he does the thing. He does the thing that it seems like only Kevin Lindsay ever, ever did, which is the tongue. He Barty Crouch Jr.'s it. That's... <laughs> For those Harry Potter fans out there. So, but that's the end of episode one is uh, Potato Head, Santarin, doing the tongue thing. We are now into episode two, which I've called The Empty Armor. And we call it The Empty Armor because there is a hyper-realistic robot that uh, (laughs) that, uh, Lynx manages to create that is completely and utterly incapable of being destroyed. It's it's basically a, a killing machine. It's absolutely terrifying. I myself was was concerned would it would it stab me through the screen. So uh, one thing about you know obviously about the costume I think we you know we've already already kind of like hit on it but this is like I mean it looks like a Santarn but it's a it doesn't look like the Santarns really that we know. The mask itself was rather heavy and so was the costume and as I was mentioning you know when we were watching the episode is you know Kevin Lindsay the actor uh, had a very serious heart condition that stresses me out so bad when i hear stuff like that unfortunately he was uh yeah he was yeah it wasn't great for him i'm sure but at the same time you know he soldiers through haha get it he said soldier (laughs) (laughs) the next time we do see the sun you know see uh the santarans plural uh, you know, it is kind of, you know, it's a, it's a different, uh, costume. Uh, but the one thing I, I always notice with that costume on Lynx, it looks like he has a Glasgow smile. Joe, uh, I, you learned what a Glasgow smile was, right? Yes. Tony knows what a Glasgow smile is as well. And I do now. Yeah. Anybody who's not familiar with what it is, it's basically, if you've seen The Dark Knight and you've seen Heath Ledger's Joker, uh, that's a Glasgow smile. His face, it's the scars. It's a wound where the corner of the victim's mouth is is cut it leaves leaves a scar in the shape of a smile and and this is why you have the explicit tag on your on your podcast for shit like this dude i don't think it's supposed to look like that i think it's supposed to look just like an, he has a very big mouth but no, it, i think it's just that it's in two pieces so that he could so it can move when he talks but uh, i think that the the centauran mask looks like like a Centaurans now, their grandpa. <laughs> he just, I mean, he just sure. looks very old. Like he's got hair coming out of his ears. He's like, he's fuzzy, wrinkly. Yeah, <laughs> he looks like a moldy muppet. When my clone batch was your age, pathetic Centauran children. But we we do get an establishing trait of the Santarans right out of the gate too, because they bring Iron Grom brings Sarah Jane to Lynx to do the unlocking the mind thing on her, and uh, he's like, "What? What is this? You have two of your species? It's it's very insufficient. Wait, fix it, change he, it." He doesn't call it insufficient. What does he call he does. it? He says it's insuff- It's an insufficient system. Change it. That's what he says. I liked that line so much. Him being, you know clone batchy and all that stuff because Santarans are all clones i just like the idea of him like being like this biological fact i don't care for it <laughs> change it and uh i mean that carries on on into new who too like with the whole running gag of him not really understanding genders calling everybody boy so let's move on boy but that's the he does do the unlocking the mind i was talking to tony that time so oh. <laughs> he learns though that uh, sarah jane is not from this time. She must have gotten here through other means. And then also, what uh, what Iron what uh, Iron Gron is using Lynx for is to create weapons so that Iron Gron and his wacky band of ne'er do wells can uh, plunder and destroy and take over other castles. They got guns, you guys. It's not like very fancy future guns. No, they're like rifles. But you know, they're really fancy future guns to. Medieval to, people. Yeah. It's that scene in every sort of, like, guy travels back to the medieval times, for some reason has a chemistry book with him, and it's like, let's make gunpowder. I swear it's happened in at least three of those, like, King Arthur movies. Like, it's Kid and King Arthur a whole lot of Guns of Avalon. Yeah, it's that. It's it's in uh, Army of Darkness. I refuse to believe that the average person who, like, 
ends up back in time is like, yeah, I can make gunpowder. Yeah, like, in, in Army of Darkness, he literally just has a chemistry book in the trunk of his car <laughs> that came with him through time. Coincidentally. It's called expediency. Like, if I went back in time and, like, had to use my future knowledge... I'd be screwed. I'd be screwed. I don't know shit. Oh, yeah, I think we'd all be, I think we'd all be up a, up a, up a creek there with, uh, without uh, the, the rowing device. I wouldn't even know how to make a paddle. You can't make a toaster <laughs> from scratch. Yeah, you can't make a toaster without slicing some bread, so. I would just, I would be like, I don't know, throw a giant rock at them? And they're like, we've got more complicated stuff than that. I'm like, well, you're ahead of me then. <laughs> <laughs> you got a catapult? Oh, damn, that's smart as hell. <laughs> it's like that episode of The Simpsons uh, with the monkey paw, the Halloween episode where Kang and Kodos, uh, part of Homer's wish is the curse and they attack and then you see one of them chasing i guess mo down the street and lisa makes a wish like oh i wish this could stop and you know you see mo chasing kodos with a with a stick he's like oh he's got a stick with a nail in it which you know is about the level of uh sophistication that i think iron Gron and blood x and i'm sure we could come up with different names for the rest of the troop there iron Gron, blood x uh meat fist Dirt shovel. Suet pants. Frankly Ray. I think that's another good one for Kind of Moist. Kind of Moist is also a good name for one of them, so. I'm um, sorry. Explicit tag. Jizz hammer. Can we get through one episode without even <laughs> talking about jizz, please? <laughs> it's one of my hobbies. Okay. Anyway. I'm not answering that. I'm not touching that one. That's all you. That's all you, sister. I'm sorry, boy. <laughs> <laughs> They've caught Sarah Jane. They've also caught the Robin Hood guy. Yes. Played by Jeremy Bullock, who is Boba Fett, uh, to you kids who have seen the uh, movies Re- Re- uh, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. That's 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 the one with the robots, right? Uh, it has a couple of them, yeah. Cool, cool, yeah. There's a tall one and a small one. Oh, so it's like Flash Gordon, cool. Which is a vastly superior film to Star Wars, and I will fight anybody who disagrees. I haven't seen it, so I don't know whether to agree or disagree, but I'll still fight you if you want. That's it. That's it. I'm leaving this podcast. I've heard the song, the flash. Ah, I've heard that. So you're 1% there, Joe. All you got to do now is watch the movie. You will love the movie. Is that a guarantee? Yeah. What if I hate it, though? Then you obviously are a person who doesn't deserve to live anymore. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> do I have to hold your hand through this whole thing? Could you? I mean, sure. Thank you. Baby. So they're going to assassinate the Robin Hood guy. So they can test out their shiny new robot. Well, there's, well, at first, like, Iron Gron's just, like, straight up gonna, like, slice him with a sword. And then he's like, no way, it'll be way more fun to, like, sick this robot on him. The robot is just a dude in some armor. Yeah. Also, I, there's a really great scene. <laughs> this doesn't look like a robot. It looks like medieval armor. Yeah, it's just I mean. medieval armor. But uh, there's def- you, there's clearly someone inside the armor. Well, did you want it to be a robot? Yeah. See, I thought that was I thought that was totally like a robot. I and, you know I thought for once BBC's uh, special effects department delivered on creating something that you know was completely not of this planet. What exactly was your expectation? That they at least they could have like. Had him duck down and put like an empty helmet. Well, on. they did eventually. Eventually, when the, when he literally loses his head, he gets decapitated. He's about to get decapitated, and suddenly he's a whole head taller. <laughs> Ironic, I know. What? That's about to happen to him. <laughs> they still do shit like that, though, because like I love it for the de- uh, for, I mean, like TV shows today. That's not Doctor Who. We were watching The Defenders. <laughs> Yeah. Spo- slight spoilers for the defenders. A character gets his hand cut off. He cuts his own hand off. But then for the rest of the time, there's a bandage that makes his arm suspiciously longer. <laughs> like a whole hands width. They don't even like try to hide it. It's just like, eh. Listen, you gotta have some suspension of disbelief. Come on now. I mean, how would that casting session go? Can we cut off your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Well, they could do like in, uh, what they do, Mad Max, just green screen it out. That's so much for a TV show. But it's the Defenders. <laughs> it's not just like a normal show. What it's a show with a budget. Just let it slide. All right, I'll let it slide. <laughs> but it's very obvious. Robot with the, with the slicey, with, all I can say has the fencing skills of a toddler. Because all it does is just kind of do this, uh, kind of, I, don't, I can't even just, I'm doing it. You can't see what I'm doing. Like a karate chop motion. 
If you've ever seen Toy Story, when Woody hits that button on the back of Buzz that makes him do the karate chop thing, it's like that. Only not as graceful. And also it's more of a, of a arm swinging motion, because it's got a sword. And also doesn't go, Buzz, 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 Lightyear to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody defeats the robot. Who defeats the robot? Because the guy doesn't die. What, the robot? Of course he doesn't. It's it's a robot. Robots can't die. Well, they, they're shooting arrows at it, and it's like, it's unstoppable. Uh, the doctor saves Hal by uh, shooting the control box with an arrow out of Iron Ground's hands. So the robot just goes, malfunction, malfunction. <laughs> Cannot compute. So so Sarah and, Sarah and Hal get to run away, uh, and they go uh, run off to uh, uh, Lord Edward's castle, and... And then they come up with the bright idea that uh, somehow the doctor is conspiring with Iron Gron to steal the scientists. Yeah, basically, Sarah Jane is like, well... He's uh, a dick. I traveled in this thing. <laughs> yeah, he knows both scientists from Unit, and he has time travel, and he's been nothing but a dick since the whole time I've known him. He's probably evil. Therefore, a witch! No, um... I think that's an interesting introduction to a companion. <laughs> to have them instantly antagonistic? I enjoyed it. Wait till you fuckers see Turlo. <laughs> okay, I don't know who that is. I know things about him. No? Yeah. It's not good? I won't tell you. Okay. Uh, while they're all coming... He's very antagonistic. Okay, I'm done. See? She spoiled it. <laughs> God. <laughs> he knows too much now. I won't tell you... I won't tell you with spoilers. He dies. No, um... <laughs> He doesn't die. I'm sorry, kids. Or does he? Just keep us on our toes. I have a feeling like he's going to be our next Ben. No, oh, don't like Ben. Patton, the, our previous guest. <laughs> no. I thought you were, I thought you were talking about that plunk Ben Jackson. Oh, God, I can't stand Ben Joe Jackson. is so mad that we're going to have to see his stupid <laughs> face again. <sighs> we're going to have to see somebody else be his stupid face. <laughs> Well, hopefully he's less of a plonk in this episode. I honestly, and and I feel bad because I, you know, from what I heard, Michael Craze was a wonderful guy. But it, yeah, I just there are times when I just wanted to punch Ben, the Macro Terra, where he, you know, goes ape shit on them because he gets, you know, he's so simple minded, he gets uh, hypnotized and trying to fight Jamie because he gets jealous that Jamie wants to wants to impress Polly or something. I don't know. It's you know. All macho bullshit. But uh, anyway, so Sarah and Hal and and Lord Edward decide that they are going to kidnap uh, the doctor. Because they want his magic for themselves. That's what the, the Lord wants. He's like, he's a magician. We can use his magic for us. Sarah's like, kind of like, well, I mean, not, that's not what I was. But, okay, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> While all this is happening, though, the doctor has found Lynx's lab and he's seen all of the he's found all of the scientists uh that are hypnotized and going around basically being slaves for Lynx under mind control but he finds Rubish who is not hypnotized because he's lost his glasses and it's a visual hypnotization process how convenient that involves wearing headphones there was just one guy who was wearing headphones I just Maybe. was very confused by that. I thought the headphones is like what hypnotized you. Because we had hypnotizing Visually. headphones in the last serial. Well, I just don't understand what else the headphones are for. Music. Gotta listen to my podcast. Gotta pick up that Radio Free Scaro, yo. <laughs> I'm listening to Harry Sullivan as an imbecile. Plug, plug, plug. The doctor starts talking to him, and Rubish is just very oblivious to what's going on. It's because he doesn't have his glasses. <laughs> He's like, do you know what time it is? And he's like, I don't know, 11:30? four o'clock. <laughs> he's like, no, we've time traveled, idiot. Ah. But Lynx comes in and sees the doctor and then shoots him. And then puts some sort of uh, device on the doctor's head so that he can't do anything except listen to Fox News podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> like he, when the doctor comes to or whatever. That is the scene where uh, the doctor says Gallifrey for the first time. Ever so casually. Lynx sort of gives his backstory of how he got onto this planet, which they've never he's never been to this planet before. He was being attacked by croutons or something. Croutons! <laughs> Routons, Routons. Santarans and Routons. The the well known thousand billion years of war. Do we ever see the Routons? We do. Oh, okay. I've heard them reference. I've never. Se- I don't know what one looks like. Do we ever see the croutons? Uh, we saw them. It was a Patrick Trotton story, I think. 
No, that was the Crotons. Sorry, Crotons. <laughs> Wasn't that a Robin Holmes story, too? It was. It was, uh, yeah. As, as was the Space Pirates, so there you go. Crotons was his first, and not his best. The Crotons or the Croutons? Cro- 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 Croatians. Croatians. So, yeah, uh, you can thank Robert Holmes for your Milo Clancy. I do, every day. Best part of that cereal. Dear Jesus, thank you for Milo Clancy. And then I just go right to sleep. I've been ever so good. Can I have a dragon when I grow up? Love me. That's not me signing off. That's me just asking Jesus to love me. <laughs> That's a request. And give you a dragon. And give me a dragon, yes. Give me a dragon and also love me. Give me a dragon and we'll be cool, yo. Because that's how religion works, right? Yeah. So the doctor is stuck in this chair with these headphones on, being forced to press buttons. Anytime he tries to get away, it, like, shocks him and stuff. And then only through the help of Rubish is he able to escape. He's He's like, like, hey, can you press these buttons? And he's like, all right. And it gets, like, an even stronger shock. He's like, ah, no, not that one, not that one. And then and then it leads to, you know, eventually the doctor does escape. Not after a very weird joke, by the way, where he's like, I need to go find a young woman. And then, like, runs out. Or a young girl. Rubish is like, oh, he seems kind of too old for that kind of shenanigans. But whatever, I won't judge. Roy Moore, is that you? <laughs> but yeah, then he gets caught, runs around, uh, in a very, like, wide shot. It's it's a, it's an echo to, to the directorial style of Werner Herzog, who does, you know, shoots, you know, these long long scenes you know there's no edits because you know anybody can put in an edit of you know anything but you know it's 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 a it's a wide shot of the doctor basically running hither and thither avoiding iron gron and his men until somehow the doctor falls and iron gron is just about ready to raise his axe when end of the episode my favorite thing about this scene is that he's just picking up random things and throwing it at them. And because it's like a wide shot with no edits, you can just see how like ineffective it is. <laughs> just like picks up a bale of hay and throws it like a couple feet to the left of where the guy was standing. <laughs> well, it's to cover up for the fact that it's actually Terry Walsh and not John Pertwee doing all that. So That's what close-ups are for. I guess they just ran out of time on that episode. I, don't, I like it. I like yeah. the scene. It's fun. It's, it's fun having like one interrupted scene of somebody just like running around and fighting with people it's even better when there's great choreography or any (laughs) or any or any but that's the end of episode two we're now into episode three which i've called up in smoke oh but uh we get the longest recap recap i think we've ever had all the way back i think it was in the middle i think it actually starts in the middle of episode two so i mean that's how long the recap is (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, though, they, this is the first time I think I've seen a recap where they do part of the recap, but then they insert some new footage and then go back to what they're recapping. Usually it's always just a couple of scenes of the last episode, but they actually intersperse some new footage as well. Because who do we who do we see up here except... It's Sarah Jane and Robin Hood. Sarah, Sarah Jane and oh, Robin Hood. What's his name? Hal. Hal. Boba Fett. It's uh, Robin Hal Fett. Boba Hal. I like this scene because basically they sort of rescue the doctor and the doctor is like, oh, thanks. Thanks for the rescue. And Sarah Jane says, this isn't a rescue. This is a kidnapping. And like takes him away. (laughs) Also, when he's running away, he runs to this like hallway and he has this torch and he just like throws it on the ground and it instantly creates like a big fire barrier that they can't get through. It just lights up super fast. Dude, you weren't there. You don't know. Uh, nothing bothers me more in a movie when someone, like, takes a cigarette and throws it onto, like, a thing of gasoline lighters or a lighter. Me. Because that's not how lighters work. Just use a match. And a match wouldn't work either. It would just go out. I just feel like a match, I would be like, fair enough. A lighter. I'm like, that's not even how they work, though. They don't stay on? They don't stay on. You can't throw a lighter and have it keep being lit even if it's a zippo i don't know yeah there's a way you can like pull out a thing in a zippo right and then it does the thing i don't know pulling out a zippo sounds like insufficient breeding processes so you know it's been a few minutes since you said jizz joe i just want you to <laughs> Jesus. don't encourage him i need encouragement no no one you ever encourages me so the, but yeah the doctor thanks them and gets promptly kidnapped yep Meanwhile, Rubish is sneakily pretending to be hypnotized while making, I guess, a monocle yeah, so, he so he can see. see. <laughs> because why not? So, but the doctor does explain to uh, Sarah Jane that I'm not behind this. I'm trying to stop this. Lynx is the, the person behind it. I, think, 
I feel like Sarah Jane accepts this pretty readily. He has the line, uh, I never lie. Hardly ever. Okay, that sounds great to me. I believe you. I'm ready to be your companion. Doctor Who was so naive back in those days. He mentions that he works for Unit. He also says something about the fair sex. I don't remember what it is in reference to, but it was yet another moment where I was like, Ugh, stop, stop. Stop being written in the 70s, please. (laughs) Yes, thing from the 70s, stop being of your age. (laughs) find it very is that, off-putting is that too much to ask for uh don't you don't you know in the 70s you should be thinking in the 90s um uh, well technically doesn't this show kind of take place in the 80s maybe I was gonna say, yeah be written from the 80s at least like you ought to be <laughs> depends depends on the dating protocol Codename Cromer. Well, I guess that doesn't even matter now because we're in medieval times. Now it's actually being of its times. It's an artifact of of what it's supposed to be. So they're acting like they're in the Middle Ages. So it's consistent. Okay, so there actually <laughs> is a scene where uh, I think like right right at the the beginning and like the second episode where Sarah Jane has been captured and she's like, "You're acting like it's the middle." Oh, right. <laughs> She's, like, calling them out on their sexism. She's like, what do you think this is? The Middle Ages? Oh, yeah, wait. Uh, Fair um, enough. Carry on. Got got me there. Egg and my face were in alignment. <laughs> we're all Sarah Jane, though. <laughs> it's yeah. like, what do you think this is? The 70s? But the oh. doctor offers to help Edward and basically become, like, the Wizard of Oz and make illusions. I mean, he's Merlin. Merlin, yeah, that makes more sense. And, you know, I don't think this show will ever revisit the idea of the Doctor meeting Merlin ever again. I think I think, I think, think it's safe to say that comparison is never, ever made. It would be like saying that Sarah Jane is a journalist. A uh, reporter, excuse me. Does she ever say what she writes for? For? I don't think she does. Journalism. She writes for Journalism Times. I write for the front desk news. So he, the doctor is basically making up all these things. He's getting everybody to make dummies. He's making some illusions. <laughs> Michael. And uh, making dummies, and he's mixing some powder stuff together. He's making stink bombs! Yay! Stinky smoke bombs! Or smoky stink bombs! Or bomby st- smoke stinks! Iron Ground shows up to fight. With Lynx, Lynx is like, I would like to be a part of this because I very much enjoy battle. Battle's good. I like battle. Which is also consistent with the way uh, they're portrayed in New Who. It's like, I wasn't doing anything better. I'd love to watch a bunch of people die. Well, actually, Iron Grunt first is like... That's too many people. We gotta go. Yeah. He just wants to turn straight back around. He's like, it's just, there's too many heads up there. That's, we're outnumbered. And uh, Lynx is like, what the fuck? Chicken? See, what I like, what I like is, is the dynamic between Iron Gron and, and Blood Axe, just because, you know, Iron Gron is just so dead set on make, trying to make something of himself, of, you know, who he is, because, you know, he basically is just surrounded by idiots. I mean, let's not mince words. And whereas Blood Axe is just, it's like the worst prop man in an entourage, you know? He's like, he's like the guy who's like, yeah, you should probably watch your cross draw levels, dude. Uh, Lynx does convince them to stay and fight because he's like, look, I'd shot this one dummy right in the head and it didn't do anything. It didn't even move. This was the scene that is actually begging for John Cleese as the French taunter from Monty Python and the Holy Grail to pop up, you know? Hello, you silly English kindergits. They just start throwing cows at Iron Gron. <laughs> But they, they pull out the ladders and they start climbing up and then this is when the they doctor releases start his... throwing smoke bombs. Smoky stink bombs. Yeah. I did not realize they were stink bombs. And you're like, why are they like, running they're away? They're just running away from smoke. These people are well, they a also terrible had, uh, army. Like flashes in them. And I guess they didn't know what that shit was at the time. So that would be terrifying, I yeah. guess. These things make noises like our guns. What is that? <laughs> what are guns? I'll tell you later. So they run away. Run away! Iron Gron gets mad, and he's he has his wine. And every time Iron Gron in this cereal has a cup of wine, he's sloshing that shit everywhere. It kind of stressed me out, to be honest. Well, it wasn't really great wine, because as he was mentioning, you know, at the very beginning, you know, the food is foul and the wine is worse, so. And they're That's almost true. out of it, though, and he's just... <laughs> He's just throwing it all around. I was like, you just got told that you're almost out of it. In the very first episode, he literally throws the wine on someone. And I was like, that's rude. (laughs) (laughs) That extra did not deserve that. (laughs) 
I want to see the Iron Gron guy to actually say that. Say, hey, wait a second, Iron Gron. Now that is you don't, okay. You want to kill? You want to kidnap? You want to destroy other people? But you you threw wine at her. But that's <laughs> unacceptable behavior. We can't let that happen. We're better than that, aren't we? I think so. But he, him, and Links actually get into a bit of a. Uh, into a little fight a little little fight because iron gron is basically links links is like you're a giant chicken and you give up too easily then we cut to interesting dynamic where both of them think they're in charge of the other one and obviously like links definitely yes (laughs) back at castle edward we have a a fun little dinner scene this dinner scene reminded me a lot of uh the dinner scene in the green death or you have like a big like someone dies and then it's just like cut to fun fun dinner party and this we've got like giant battle cut to fun dinner party. You know I'm always for it though. <laughs> Nothing like a good battle to really whet the appetite though. Like the doctor is like eating like chicken or something and throwing the bones. What is <laughs> The king does it. He watches the king do it, and he gives, like, this little nod, and then he also does it. And he's like, yes. And Sarah Jane is like, you disgusting swine. <laughs> <laughs> and the doctor's like, I am fitting in here. I am doing a great job. Unlike some journalists. You are you are a journalist, right? I think you said you were a journalist. I don't remember. But the doctor's like, we need to capture his castle, and I have a plan to do so. I'm going to make this secret potion. Spoilers, like how- it's fucking roofies. <laughs> I like how excited the queen gets whenever he's like talking about his plan. When he's like organizing the first plan, he's like, I think I can, I've got like, I can, there's some stuff I can do. And she was like, some spells? You're going to do some spells on them? And he's like, "Uh, like, I guess. And now he's like, yeah, I think, I think maybe if I get some of the right ingredients, I can make something that can help us. And she's like, with a potion? You're going to make a potion with your magic? And she's just like, so happy. (laughs) And the doctor's like, uh, yeah, I guess you can call it a potion if you want. I don't know. This was 1990s. I'd opened a new age store. <laughs> then there's this adorable kind of scene between Iron Gron and Blood Axe, where Iron Gron is just like talking to Blood Axe, like, I oh, don't know, man. It's, I'm just, I'm a big disappointment. It's just like opening his heart and soul to Blood Axe, and Blood Axe is like, yeah. I'm very surprised at how shitty you are. I thought you would have been better. Iron Gron's like, fuck, I am great. Shut up. <laughs> you expect a freeze frame on Blood Axe and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, hear Sarah McLaughlin's in an arm, in the arms of an angel or whatever that song is, start to play and they start doing a slow zoom into Blood Axe's sad face. In the arms of an angel. Yeah, you think that's going to happen, but then he's just like, yeah, you are kind of shit. And it's like, the record scratch. I was looking for a pep talk, boss. But uh, the doctor and Sarah Jane sneak into the castle. Dressed as friars. They pretend pretend to be friars, and they walk past these guards. And then the guards say something in such a thick accent, I have no idea what they said. That's why you watch these shows with subtitles. They just start laughing, too. I think the gist of it is that they're like, Oh yeah, the king's gonna totes like rob them and shit. It was it was something along the lines of if there is a god, they better pray to him or something. I don't know. It was it was basically <laughs> They laugh way too hard. They are <laughs> hamming it. Uh, They're having a good time. And it wasn't even that funny, you know? It was just like, oh, religious people. They're fucked. <laughs> Jism. <laughs> God damn it. It'd been ten minutes, Tony. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the doctor and Sarah Jane go to the lab where the scientists are now passing out because they're, like, not being fed. We haven't had food. We haven't slept don't have water this labor camp is like a lot of work guys lynx is treating these people like i treated my tamagotchi lynx Co- is treating these people like i treat myself on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's sad <laughs> i need to eat how many meals a day oh, at so least many. two right <laughs> i know you're supposed to eat three but two is a is a good start right <laughs> I think so. try harder tony come on <laughs> We, we gotta introduce this girl to the concept of eating pants. Like, she used to get, like, grumpy in the mornings, and then I'd be like, did you eat anything? And she'd be like, well, no. I'm like, well, that's why. In my defense, food tastes gross in the morning. I eat, like, food at all times. I could eat right now. I love eating. I know. 
It's like one of my favorite. It's like top three. Uh, I won't say what the other two are, but Jism. Jism damn near killed him. No. Come on. <laughs> so we find out that Lynx is planning to shoot off uh, in his ship, <clears throat> but that will. <laughs> I'm gonna leave. <laughs> oh God! Can we? Can we? Do, can you not say shoot off? Maybe <laughs> I'm just asking because. <laughs> All right. So his ship will blow off. <laughs> He's doing this on purpose now. Anyway, his ship will ejaculate into an explosive uh, miasma of... So yeah, basically, Lynx wants to get off this uh, forsaken planet, and uh, doing so, uh, his ship will destroy pretty much uh, everything. That's how you do it, Joe. That's how you do it. He wants to get off the planet. So the doctor is in the room with the scientists and is <laughs> breaking their hypnosis with uh, a little light pin. Yeah, what does he say? Uh, what does he call it? I don't know. Because like, I mean, he gives it some sort of fancy techno babble where he's like, it's a neurological input. <laughs> of course it is. Most things are. Lynx comes back. The the Him dehypnotizing that guy, does, he doesn't find out about that. Mm-hmm. But Lynx comes back and the doctor says he will help Lynx to get off this planet if he'll just send everyone else back to their back own home. time. And Lynx is like, um... No, and shoots him. Just shoots him right in the face. And then that's the end of episode three. We're now into episode four, which is the first episode with Tom Baker. <laughs> the doctor died. He got shot in the face. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works. Oh, I've called this episode the Iron Doctor, by the way. I don't remember why. <laughs> <laughs> but, I do. Oh, okay. But yeah, no, it's just the doctor it just falls to the ground and is kind of sleepy. That's all that really happens. Why doesn't Lynx just murder his ass? Lazy. Because the show's called Doctor Who. And you don't want to call it Lynx. Why not? They just made that shiny new uh, intro. They'd have to make a brand new one. Exactly. They'd have to find a, a Lynx-shaped hole for Lynx to step into. Lynx would be like, I cannot get into this John Putwe hole. This hurts. Well, okay, okay, but they have Sarah Jane still. They could just rename it the Sarah Jane Adventures. That's not going to happen. That's already a thing. What? First, we have to go through K-9 and company before we get to Sarah Jane, but more on that later. Okay, so the doctor is trying to talk sense into Lynx. Mm-hmm. Lynx is not listening. Rubish is sort of creeping around, pretend- still pretending to be hypnotized, I assume. Uh, but the doctor's like casually like, Oh, hey, you know how you have that Achilles heel on the back of your neck? You only have that one weakness. Just... Pointing it out. The probic vent. Rubish smacks it. He goes down. And they tie him up. Like a sack of potatoes, that potato fell. While they're tying him up, Blood Axe comes in to get in because uh, Iron Gron is wanting to talk to Lynx. And the doctor just puts the helmet on and is like, I am Lynx. He doesn't even do a voice, really. No, not really. He just has the helmet on. He doesn't even see the helmet. He's just using it to make it sound like he's wearing a helmet, I guess. (laughs) No, no. Let me talk to you, Lynx. Uh, uh, I'm in here, TCB. Be out in a few minutes. So the doctor has come up with his plan to distract Iron Gron with the robot while Rubish dehypnotizes the rest of the scientists with the pen. Are you keeping up, kids? Sarah Jane has been sent away to do take the doctor's stuff to the kitchen, whatever he made, his potion to the kitchen. She gets caught and basically forced to work in the kitchen as a scullery maid while the doctor pretends to be the robot oh you know we haven't talked about what how nice sarah jane's outfit looks in this scene oh yeah it's very uh medieval the green felt outfit yes i thought it was blue i also thought it was blue i thought it was green that's probably teal split the difference and say teal it's black no it's black and gold is it blue and blue or is it yellow isn't that the, the the dress situation? Anyway, but uh, Iron Gron is going to fight the robot, <laughs> which is the doctor in the robe in the armor, basically doing that shitty arm movement. <laughs> he has to pretend to be a worse fencer than he is. But then he starts doing actual fencing to the point where he's where Iron Gron is like, <sighs> "Hey, Blood Axe, <sighs> join me!" And so it's him and Blood Axe going at, going at the doctor. He's fighting them off two at a time. I think isn't what like gets him in trouble is 
his mouth. He, he can't just shut up. <laughs> and that's what tips everyone. Well, they're like, we're going to put some, uh, we're going to put some cross bol- bolts in him and see how he likes. Maybe that'll slow him down. Hardly sporting old chap. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, wait, what? That's not how a robot talks. I know how robots talk, despite being in medieval times. This robot has very received pronunciation. He's like, I'm going to take your mask off and see what's under there. And the doctor's like, no, it'll give you a seizure. And he's like, what the fuck is a seizure? (laughs) I'm from medieval times. We don't have medical terms. We don't even have internet. So he takes the mask off and, uh... Hey, it's the doctor. Instead of Iron Gron killing him, he's like, I'm going to kill you with wizardry. Why does he... He, like, almost killed people multiple times, and he's like... Wait a second, that's not cool enough. That's not complicated enough. I want a van. No, wait, let me get a van with flames painted on him. Which is the Iron Ground theory of of fighting, I guess, I don't know. So, but meanwhile, Sarah Jane has uh, successfully poisoned everyone, the food. Roofied. Roofied, roofied. I think she does a, like, oh, what is that? And then dumps it in. Sort of <laughs> That's thing. exactly what she does. Classic mix- misdirection. Never seen since uh, David Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear. Google that, kids. Whatever happened to that? Did they bring it back? Did he bring it back? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's 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 a name. It's a weeping angel. Don't you remember? All oh, right. No, right. I do not. I need, I do not remember that. I have no memory of that whatsoever. <laughs> it's not a silence. It's an a weeping angel. I have very little memory of that either. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they all say. Uh, we're going to defeat you with wizardry, which is we're going to kill you with the guns. But they don't, none no. of them know how to use guns yet. So, so it's they can't the, aim. It's just the doctor running around, trying not to get shot. This time, not in a wide shot. <laughs> he's just like, they're like trying to like, how do you load this? I did, okay. And he's just getting out of the way just because they're bad at it. But they in, in, they invented the firing range. Future stormtroopers, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> But Sarah Jane comes to the rescue and swings him a chandelier that he, uh... Because how else would you get out of that situation? Running past them? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can only swing past them. And then they run out and the doctor and uh, Sarah Jane get to the, like, the entrance and there's the two guards. And he just casually strolls out and holds his hands out to them. And they come up and look at, like, what? what? And then he just bonks their heads. These are my favorite scenes. These are my favorite third Doctor moments. Where he just, like, defeats the bad guys by, by, like, doing a coin trick. And the bad guy's like, what's that? Just by doing something completely unexpected. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's always nice to kind of see the the Doctor kind of do that, uh, the magician thing. It's like, oh, look at this shiny thing. Pow! Right in a kisser. And then, uh, they get away. part of three. They run away, and Iron Gron is too, like, he's like, ah, oh, we would come after you, but it's, uh, it's dinner time, so, gotta go get that noms. We, we, we need to eat our, our, our festering meat and rank wine, and drink our rank wine. And yeah, and this is when everyone starts passing out. They go back to get the rest of the scientists, the doctor and Sarah Jane. Lynx comes in and finds him doing this, tries to shoot the doctor, but he has this fancy fan. Ooh, I love his, like, shield. His geisha umbrella fan. It's beautiful. And then he, you know, goes into his Venusian karate on links. (laughs) Venusian Aikido is what it's called. I hope whoever designed that prop is very proud. Yes. Because I'm proud of them. I know what Tony's gonna be wearing uh, next uh, summer and spring, because she travels back in time like anybody does. Summer and spring. Anyway. (laughs) Boba Fett is going around disarming everyone. But somehow wakes up Iron Gron. I'm not entirely sure why Iron Gron woke up and no one else did. He, like, wakes up just from sheer force of will. Of, like, what? I've been drugged? No! I'm too stupid to be drugged. <laughs> Hold my mead! No. Well, they're sending away the scientists, right? All the scientists are gone? Are, are being, yes, are being sent back to their to their regular time. Not their regular station. And Iron Gron, Gron comes to attack Lynx. But Lynx shoots him, and I guess he dies. Four episodes too late. Robin Fett warns Blood Axe that, that your castle's gonna, you know. Because, you know, this, if, if you guys are remembering the Lynx, when he enters his ship, uh, destroys the entire castle. Uh, Robin Fett warns Blood Axe to get out, and everybody gets out as the ship starts taking off. But as the, before the ship can take off, Robin Hood shoots Lynx in the blowhole. <laughs> with Whoa. his with his bow and arrow, right in the blowhole, right in the blowhole, 
But uh, everyone gets out, and then the castle explodes kind of off screen. We just get a cut to uh, some stock footage of rocks falling. Yeah, not not the castle exploding. It, it's kind of like a rock, like a cliff with an explosion on it. Uh, apparently, in the special edition, they fixed that. They they put in some CGI castle exploding or something. Well, it better be really in, really special. But again, I want to see the shitty version. Give me the shitty version. That's what I want. But uh, the Doctor and Sarah Jane say goodbye to Robin Hood, Boba Fett, Hal, and uh, Tardis out. And Hal is like, <gasps> magic. But the problem is, he goes, <gasps> magic. And then it cuts to the shot of the TARDIS not doing anything. Then it fades away. It is making that noise. Well, it's beca- it's making the wheezing, groaning noise. So he's like, probably like, what the hell? It's just a wooden box. But it would. I feel like they should have flipped those. It would have been a more. It would have been a more effective edit the other way around. Yes, that that is true. show fade away, then show him re- make the same reaction. But that's it. That's the that's the end of uh, the Time Warrior, and then the end credits roll. So. Uh, Doctor Who is played by John Pertwee. <laughs> Sarah Jane Smith, a reporter, is played by Liz Sladen. Nicholas Courtney's the Brigadier. Jeremy Bullock's Boba Hood. Anyway, so anyway, <clears throat> I digress. We are going to take a short break, and then we will be back for final thoughts. Final thoughts. Hey there, folks. My name is JC Delatore. And I'm Rita Delatore. And we are Transmissions from Atlantis, an original member of the ESO network, and we are excited to tell you all about our podcast. Well, it's everything science fiction, fantasy, horror. And every single episode will have a segment of Doctor Who. Let's give everybody a taste. I have my two minutes. Yes. Okay, then. So no interrupting. Go ahead. Fine. You're using up your two minutes. Shut up. You're interrupting me. Stop (laughs) it. You're now up to 50 seconds. (laughs) This was worse than Kill the Moon. It was not worse than Kill the Moon. I would take the moon as an egg (laughs) before I would take a bunch of trees, sprout up overnight, save the earth, and then magically... And where did the trees go? Where did the trees go? (laughs) Yes. Transmissions from Atlantis. Class. Classy sci-fi pop culture discussions. Check us out, transmissionsfromatlantis.com. And we are back. Wow, that was a quick break. Uh, it is now time for... Final thoughts! So, guest... <laughs> guest Brian? Yes. What are your final thoughts? Uh, you know, it's a, a Robert Holmes uh, story, so I obviously will always rate those higher than I would say, you know... Uh, John Lucarotti story, but uh, I would have to give this probably a six. It's a it's a good introduction to the to the Santarans, but it kind of gets all muddled in with this cockamamie idea of, of of Links deciding to arm humans with you know primitive to him weapons. So I am yeah, maybe a seven. I guess maybe I'm being too uh, distasteful. No, not distasteful. What's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, you'll edit in the right word later, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> jizz. Yes, jizz. I'm being too jizzy. Um, I'm getting. I'm getting jizzy with it. Um, uh, so far as Sarah Jane, it's a very good. You know, it's a good introductory episode. You don't really have. You know, the the time when the companion kind of takes an instant dislike to. Uh, to your main character, but, uh, you know, that's what we have. And uh, overall, I think uh, my favorite character in the whole story is still Rubish. I would say that this is a pretty solid filler episode, <laughs> <laughs> which feels weird to say about uh, a serial that established so much, really. Um, like a pretty big reoccurring villain, uh, Gallifrey, you know, one of the most beloved companions of all times. Which is something I would have liked to have seen more of. The the stuff that I saw in Sarah Jane uh, in this serial, really loved. Wish there was more of it. I wish they'd have told us what her job was. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it is kind of, yeah, it is kind of a, wow, this is supposed to start a season off. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not, it's not a bad serial. It's just almost uh, lackluster, I guess. And, yeah, it is kind of a weak starting point uh but then again i am probably television back then didn't have the kind of event uh format say that you know say we have nowadays 
Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. I thought it was a fun serial. I liked the Santaran. I liked the, the, the knights. I feel like the, the, the bad guys, the, like Iron Gron and Blood Axe, I thought they were great. I feel like Edward and Eleanor and that whole group was kind of underdeveloped. And I, I, they they're just not, sort of happened. Yeah, they're just sort of there for, I guess, for someone for the doctor to sort of align himself with, but they don't really do a whole lot. There is not that much to, uh, yeah, to, to Lord Edward and, uh, his lady Dot Cotton. Or, or even, uh, Hal, uh, Robin Hood guy. Yeah, he is, yeah, he is just kind of the, the dashing hero for no reason whatsoever. Exactly. But the plus sides of this, Oh, uh, well, and another, I want to say another negative thing before I get to the positive things. Uh, the doctor was very sexist and a dick. That's rude. So yeah. rude. Stop being rude. He was very rude. Very rude. Which, I've had this problem a few times with three. So, he, he I felt like he had gotten past that, and now it's back, and it makes me sad. Because this is his last season. I'd like him to go out on a good run, but like... He did a lot of things that made me not like him in this mm. episode, in this serial. I mean, although it's, it's, but it's a, it's fun. Uh, the Santarn is great. Sarah Jane comes in solid. Mm-hmm. Like, she is, like, for Joe, it took me a, a little bit to completely warm up to her because I feel like there was trouble writing her to begin with. Oh, yeah. Like, it took her, I feel like it took the writers a little while to get a, a handle on her character. They wrote her almost like she was a child at times. <laughs> But, like, I feel like with Sarah Jane, I feel like they, her character is there, like, now. There's uh, there's no, like, easing in. She's there. And I I am excited to see more of her. You kind of, you kind of get the idea that uh, Sarah Jane was created with an, with an idea in mind. Whereas, you know, Joe was kind of more of a uh, return to the traditional companion, you know, after Liz Shaw uh, being almost an equal to the Doctor. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's always interesting to meet new friends, and of course, you know, we fans love Sarah Jane, and nary a bad word has ever been said about her. Uh, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good first story. Uh, she kind of, you know, starts off on the wrong foot in assuming the Doctor's the bad guy. I like that, though. I love that. Yeah, it's, so yeah, it is different, so... But yeah, it, uh, you know, I mean, you know, it's not a wasn't a waste of time to watch it. Obviously, oh no, oh no, seen this one quite a few times. The problem with like Joe to begin with is she was like you were saying, like they they knew what they were doing. With Sarah Jane, I feel like with Joe, she was written specifically almost as a reaction to Liz Shaw uh, of wanting to do something like the complete opposite of Liz Shaw. Whereas Sarah Jane, it seems like they've written some. A character. Yes. And not a reaction to another character. So I, I am, I am down for that. But, um, oh no, it was a pretty, it was okay. It was, it was fun. It wasn't amazing. It's not top tier, but it's, it's They can't all be top tier. That's why there are tiers. They all can't be Day of the Daleks, right, guys? <laughs> God. They all I will can't say be Edge of Destruction. I, I'd actually say it's better than the past two serials we've had. I say it's better Ooh. than Green Death and um, Planet of the Daleks. Controversial. But um, that's it um, before we head out. Brian, any plugs? Give us your plugs. Do you maybe have a podcast? Do you have a podcast? you could plug? Are you a journalist? I, I am back in the podcasting thingy. I do a, uh, think I may have, uh, mentioned in passing, uh, Harry Sullivan is an imbecile, uh, Doctor Who podcast. Going to be recording our next episode coming up this Saturday. Uh, we're going meta early, so episode seven will probably have already dropped by this time, so, uh, you'll probably already had known by then that, uh, we have discussed whether Harry Sullivan is actually an imbecile. <gasps> what? I know, it's crazy, crazy. It's crazy, man. I'm excited. Yeah, I think we're running out of ideas. We haven't technically gotten to Harry Sullivan yet, but we have gotten to the actor, so that's something. Well, there you go. Yes, uh, Captain Andrews. Carnival of Monsters. Yes, there you go. So, where can people, where can people find Harry Sullivan as, Sullivan as an imbecile? Well, we are just all over the internet, kids. Uh, we're, uh, uh we have our WordPress site up at imbecilepod.wordpress. Uh, we're on Twitter at Imbecile Pod, and uh, we also have a Facebook page. Just look for Imbecile Pod. We try try to keep everything consistent and simple. So, uh, Imbecile Pod. Harry Sullivan is an imbecile. Uh, we're also on Lipson as well. A Tumblr, I think. We got a Tumblr. We got a Twitter. There's a LinkedIn page. 
uh, Pinterest where we uh, show off all the uh, all the uh, recipes that we uh, have been collecting over the years. Uh, Adam, who is my podcasting partner, makes a, a great crispy eclair. So, how's that Tinder coming though? Oh, uh, well, the Tinder is still a work in process, so we're we're st- still still having to you know we're uh, beating out the gremlins, shall we say? Uh, so that's exciting. I uh, I'm going to say that. Yes, it is very good. I've listened to most of it. And by most of it, he means kind of one episode. I've listened, I've listened to the first five. I need to listen to the sixth one. I was, I didn't get around to it. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. I also want to say thank, I, I'm glad that there's other people out there who 